<laughs> hey everyone, forgive the uh, mess, for I have in fact been taking a break. Oh yes, I know, it's pretty incredible. Now at some point I should probably get back to making videos, but I'm having too much fun playing video games all day. I'm no stranger to the idea of the best. I've talked about the best video game music and the best video game records, but have you guys ever heard of video games? They're pretty cool. And what better way to start off the new year than talking about the best and brightest of 2021? Suffice to say, last year was rough for a lot of reasons, but while the Game Awards may have you believe that Deathloop was one of the only games to release last year, we got a lot of great new stuff. I'm talking Chicory, Everhood, Inscription, Bowser's Fury, 13 Sentinels, Metroid Dread, Death's Door, SMT5, Endwalker, and a whole lot of games I didn't even get to play because I dumped over 100 hours into Genshin Impact. Genshin Impact. So much more, in fact, that it's time for my best games of 2021 where not every game has to have come out in the year of 2021 because I played a lot of stuff. Well, that is what I would say if I'd actually had time to put a colossal video together. This is the place where I was going to give some fun awards to the best games I played, but I sort of haven't finished it yet. And if I made this list by myself, it'd just be a small sample of my favorite games. So it's time to outsource to my talented friends and colleagues. Now, if I want to make sure that people don't catch on to what I'm doing here, I decided to give everyone complete freedom with their game choices. So I'm letting everyone talk about whatever aspects they Want, from music to gameplay to art style. I did tell them to try to keep it to 2021 though, because if I didn't, I think Grizzly would just pick Another Hollow Year, Another Hollow Night, baby, that's right, a motherfucking masterpiece, game of the year, every year, any opposing opinion is invalid, I don't give a shit, what do you mean this is why I shouldn't make review videos? This game gave me solace. In a year where I felt the stupendous burden of being an adult, and even worse, being a content creator. After my first playthrough in late 2020, the love never stopped growing from this baby gribbo wonder of exploring the unknown into a much deeper appreciation and admiration. The more I continued to play, the more I continued to treasure. But fuck all that. This year, still being a fucking infant to the game, I learned that Hollow Knight has one of the greatest communities ever from speed runs to challenge runs to bingo there is an abyssal measure of content building on the base game but that chef's kiss mm -mm, good good is all about the mods Yay! and god damn it you thought i kept playing this game for the mood music atmosphere and lore no it's the mods this is the only game where i can be small and be happy about it. Look how cute I am, bro. I be laying out bitches and princes while the size of this tiny little cat, bro. Imagine this cat walks up to you, meows, and then pulls out a nail and cuts your big toe up. Like, what are you gonna do about it? Or, or I can just walk up to the Hollow Knight and shoot this bitch in the face. There's also mods that turn this regular Nightmare King Grim fight into some inferno god king nightmare cock crusher gooch grinder grim boss battle that only the dedicated hollow knight creators and nerds attempt however one of the best mods that's really kept the shade out of my soul is the one that allows multiplayer i've seen lots of people make fun games out of this like hide and seek and hunts but for me being able to find the same joy out of taking friends through the game for their first time that i had when i first played is something really special. I don't think there's many games other than like Persona story. that I enjoy replaying and watching people play so much. Of course, Hollow Knight has one glaring flaw because it is severely lacking a goddamn sequel. Give me Silk Song before I mod in some anime titties onto all the crops. Hollow Knight? Well, thanks for having me in your video, Yakko. 
My favorite game of 2021 is Wobble Dogs, baby, let's go. Wobble Dogs came out early last year, and put simply, Wobble Dogs is a game about wobbly dogs. It's a pet simulator where you can raise a hive of dogs that mutate based on what you feed them, build them cool rooms, and overall, just chill out in a nice, relaxing environment. And of course, you can pet them. Look at this good boy. It's kind of hard to tell you what the goal of Wobble Dogs actually is. It doesn't really have one, and it's kind of hard to explain the appeal until you actually try. I don't know what it is about them, but it's just so addicting and relaxing to play with your virtual pets. I've definitely formed meaningful bonds with my dogs, and it's really nice to check in with them over the weeks. It's one of the most soothing and calming experiences I've ever had. Add furniture, grow some flowers, add a dog den, get wobbly, make a long dog, make a small dog, feed them bananas, feed them nuggets, get wobbly, train your dogs, hatch eggs and grow your dogs. It's really just a wobbly game about wobbly things with a lot of surprises along the way, and the dogs are cute and funny and Sometimes they'll just kick around and be adorable. The music is sick and wobbly, the art is sick and wobbly, the atmosphere is sick and wobbly, the dogs are sick and wobbly. I just don't really know what else I can say. This is probably one of the best wobbly games of this wobbly year, and that's why I love Wobble Dogs. Okay, bye. Wow, that game looks sick and wobbly. I played a lot of new games in 2021. Ruin King, Monster Hunter Rise. Uh, listen, video games in Canada cost upwards of $90. I gotta make sacrifices somewhere. But out of all of the games that rose in popularity this year, both new and old, one stands above the rest to me. My personal game of the year is Friday Night Funkin'. Uh, I can explain. Now, is this game exemplary in terms of quality? Hell no, it's basically a glorified Flash animation. Is it lively with content? Not really, you could beat it in about 30 minutes. Have I beat the damn game? Hell no, you think I got time for that? I'm too busy bashing fictional League of Legends K-pop characters. That and my incompetence at rhythm games prevents me from beating Pico on fucking easy mode. But what this game is, is a phenomenal example of what a community can do for a game. Both good, and bad. While the base game is fairly decent on its own, with a pretty bop and soundtrack to boot, the sheer amount of mods of equal or greater quality have completely eclipsed the base game. Hell, if you had a keen eye, you might have noticed all of the background music and the majority of the background footage have all been from mods, not the actual game. And there's so many good ones! Bro, the Among Us and Sonic.exe mods are genuinely good with amazing soundtrack. How the hell does that even happen? It's gone to the point that some of these modded characters have become so synonymous with Friday Night Funkin' that they are often mistaken to be part of the base game. And it's... <laughs> I think that's just kind of incredible. And as someone who's personally had their own ideas and jokes turn into something completely different by their own community, no matter how cursed, I can't help but relate and find it just so cool. I've been so inspired by it all that I've started working on my own mod. When will it come out? I don't know, this shit takes so long to do, man. I can't help but appreciate the sheer amount of creativity cranked out of this simple Flash game each and every day. It actually makes me concerned that when the full game does release, it won't possibly be able to live up to what fans of the game have already been able to make themselves. And while of course the community is not without its faults, frankly outside of the mod space it's somehow gotten worse than the Undertale fanbase, the overwhelming amount of creativity from genuinely talented and good people oozing out of this game each and every day, and this act of a community turning a a small little indie game into something so massive is why it's my personal favorite game of 2021. Even though it was released in 2020. <laughs> Shut up! Hmm. There's been a lot of indie stuff so far. Do I even know anyone that likes AAA games? Hey Yako fans, Yakos, Yakomis, I have no idea what you guys are called, but I'm here to talk about my favorite game of 2021. And mine kind of slides by by a technicality because it's Halo Infinite. The game technically came out right at the end, I'm talking December 2021, but it has since taken over all of my time. I love this game with a passion, and don't get me wrong, it has a ton of issues, but when it's good, it's phenomenal. I've always been in love with this franchise, but for a while, it kind of just disappeared and stopped being relevant. Then along comes Halo Infinite, which is essentially the spiritual successor to one of my favorite games, Halo 3. It plays like a classic Halo game while adding a lot of really unique and fun features. Stuff as simple as just sprinting and mantling help 
modernize the game while still keeping the majority of the main weapons the same. The maps look so gorgeous, the ways you can customize your Spartan is pretty cool, and the best part about it all is that the multiplayer is free to play, which has allowed for me to play with a lot of people that normally wouldn't want to play games like this, like my brothers or my cousins. They all gave Halo Infinite a try and now we're playing every week. I guess I should have clarified, I meant more the Halo Infinite multiplayer, not the campaign. The campaign's fine, but like, we're not here to talk about that. It has the potential to grow to become an even better game, because content-wise, it is lacking, but everything in the game at the moment feels very solid. Ninja. Look at that, I just ninja'd that guy in 2021. Okay, thank you so much for inviting me, Yako. Bye! Hey man, a uh, completely random question here. What was your favorite game from last year? Really? Me too! Okay, so I have this idea for a video. Hey, it's me, Iron Pineapple, or as some people know me, the Dark Souls, Souls-like guy. Now you might be thinking, oh, his game of the year is the Elden Ring Network Test. And yeah, it's up there, you got me. But my real game of the year for 2021 is actually the Outer Wilds Echoes of the Eye DLC expansion. And if you haven't yet played it, I hope the fact that I'm choosing DLC instead of a full game is somewhat persuasive for you giving it a shot yourself. The developers at Mobius Digital really proved that it wasn't a fluke, and lightning can strike twice when it comes to crafting an unforgettable experience that only the medium of gaming could convey. And I don't want to say too much more than that. This is just one of those games that really benefits from you going in as blind as possible, so I'm not even showing you footage from the DLC area itself. If you're a fan of exploration, space travel, uncovering mysteries, and piecing together the remnants of dead civilizations, play this game in its DLC. Outer Wilds is an incredible experience that I still find myself thinking about almost two years after I played it, and Echoes of the Eye will no doubt linger in my mind the same way. And oh my god, when I finally figured out the part with the jellyfish, my brain was like... Poof, right in the cabin too, it's so good! What I love. Hello, I'm Scruffy. And my favorite game released in 2021 has been Unpacking by Witchbeam. It's a chill indie game where all you need to do is clear your moving boxes by unpacking items one by one and placing them in an appropriate spot in a room or across multiple rooms. There's no time limit and no narration or directly shown characters. Instead, the overarching story is inherent in the items you're unpacking and in each of the new spaces you move into. So, while you dress up a room as you see fit, you'll also start to take note of items you've seen before, or keepsakes that shed a little light on who the protagonist of this game is. In addition to that beautifully subtle storytelling, I also love this game's sound design. There was a puzzle for the sound team here. How do you make a sound for an item that can be placed in multiple ways, in different types of room, on different types of surfaces? Sound designers Jeff and Angela Van Dyke solved this by simply making a sound for every possibility, for a total of at least 14,000 sound foley files. It's insane attention to detail that could not go unappreciated. Brilliant work. And I look forward to the games and sounds that Witchbeam crafts next. Wow! All those games looked fantastic! I've been working really hard on my section. So without further ado, here we go. My 2021 completely random category video game awards. Oh, 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 fuck. That's the wrong one. I gotta start off with music. I have to, all right? My blood was boiling watching the game awards. Well, it always is for a multitude of reasons, but I was hoping they'd improve upon relegating best soundtrack to a 59 second segment in the pre-show. And they, uh, they made it a 10 second segment instead. I give up at this point, it's my job now. With some incredible honorable mentions like Guilty Gear Strive, Persona 5 Strikers, and SMT5, there was some strong competition for my favorite soundtrack this year, and yet the winner was still crystal clear. Despite the original game releasing almost 12 years ago, I never played it, so it doesn't count. Near Replicant's soundtrack is just, goddamn, no real music theory needed, my heart's gonna feel this one. I 
I've got something of a mixed memory, all things considered. I can memorize pages upon pages of song lyrics, and I can vividly recall most of the videos I've made, but you could hold a gun to my head and I probably wouldn't be able to tell you someone's birthday. Hell, I'm apt to forget sizable pieces of even my favorite media. After I played Near Automata, the soundtrack instantly became one of my all-time favorites, but over time, I forgot the details of why I enjoyed the game so much. However, a quick listen to the music always serves to flood me with the emotion that fills in those gaps, and after absolutely loving the story of Near Replicant, I think even more so than Automata, I know that the music will help those feelings stick with me for years to come. I find that lyrics are often a key factor in how people find meaning in their favorite songs, and yet Emmy Evans and the vocal choir are able to deliver some of the most beautiful performances I've ever heard, despite the fact that the words they sing are pure chaos. Literally, it's called chaos language, shit's not even real, they just made it up for the games. Yet it's designed with purpose, made to sound like what a future amalgamation of different world languages could sound like. It makes every song in Replicant's soundtrack have a strangely nostalgic feeling, from the bittersweet to the absolutely heart-wrenching. Throughout the game's, uh, debatable amount of backtracking, the music was always the one constant pulling me towards the end. Every song feels identifiable and iconic in each of its evolutions, twisting from blissful town themes to tear-jerking boss battles over the course of the game's five endings. This isn't just a re-recording of a decade-old soundtrack, either. New songs composed for 1.22's new content like Fleeting Words and alternate versions of Kainé's theme are some of the best on the entire album. Meanwhile, every returning song is given so much polish that I really fucking wish they'd just put it on Spotify or YouTube already, or any music service. I mean, it's not like I didn't already rip the soundtrack CD I bought from Square Enix, but come on guys, give me something, I don't wanna have to put you down there in chaotic evil with Nintendo. I honestly just can't pin down exactly what it is that makes Nier's music so special. It's not like it's the only game to use orchestral instrumentation, vocal choirs, or fake languages. Is it the endearing characters and gripping story that boosts the music? or the music that boosts the story. It's probably both. Nier's music is able to embody the very essence of emotion. It just so happens that those emotions tend to be... just sad as hell. I've never really been a huge fan of fighting games, partially because I like playing more than one or two games per year so I don't have a thousand hours to dump into practicing combos, and partially because I think it's just a genetic thing. Oh look, honey, he's about to say his first word. La. Oh my god, he's gonna say love. LIGHT PUNCH! Medium PUNCH! Despite all this, I felt intoxicated by Guilty Gear Strive's gorgeous visuals, radical character designs, and god-tier music. I was tempted. And yes, I gave into temptation, and yes, it was awesome! Gear Strive fixes the main problem that I always felt was blocking me from playing fighting games, the knowledge and practice required to have fun. Playing a game where getting hit once means getting comboed for 75% of my health has never really appealed to me, and the practice of actually memorizing a touch of death in the training room feels like the video game equivalent of homework. But the easy to pick up, hard to master mechanics of Strive caught my attention. In Strive, combos exist, and there are plenty of people that know all sorts of batshit crazy ones, but in most of my matches, the average combo has been like, less than 10 hits, and if you don't want to be in a combo anymore, you occasionally get to use the burst move, which is a button that lets you just go no. Mom said it's my turn. There's still room for an incredible amount of personal improvement and skill expression, but the barrier to entry felt accessible this time around, especially considering the tower matchmaking actually put me with people around my skill level right from the beginning. I know I'm not the intended audience for most fighting games. I was never looking to sink thousands of hours into Guilty Gear, and the concept of a casual player is practically non-existent. But I still had a ton of fun discovering how to ride dolphins and clock people in the head with a massive anchor, decimate people as a giant dolphin that is definitely part of the game, walk around menacingly with a gun and hop into a convertible after I win, or light afros on fire, blow myself up with meteors and bombs, and hit someone with my big knife, turn it into a fishing pole, and knock them into the next dimension like a fucking golf ball. Also, when you play a mirror match as Happy Chaos, they high-five each other before the match starts, and that shit is so stupid and awesome. And the music, I... 
If Near Replicant hadn't already stolen my spot on this list, my favorite soundtrack of 2021 would have definitely been Strive. But hey, style encompasses so much more. One moment you'll be listening to some heavy metal with the strangest lyrics you've ever heard, some dude screaming A B C D E F GO! A, B, C, D, e, F, go. And then the lyrics get real and they go piano ballad mode. Sweet memories. And then it's jazz. It took me 10 years to find the answer something. And then it's the best song. Every character, stage, voice line, and music track in Guilty Gear is absolutely bursting with such a unique and exciting energy, and the game's ability to be engaging even for a baby like me is what keeps me coming back every month for some matches with the boys. What? The little man! The, the little, little man! man. <laughs> <laughs> Just running at me with the gun out. <laughs> Oh, oh you so shot him! Divinity. You can't do that! <laughs> I just destroyed an endangered species. Imagine a pistol, right? Shoots bullets like normal. Now imagine flipping a coin into the air, and if you shoot the coin, it instantly headshots an enemy. Now imagine about five billion demons and angels. By no means do I ever consider myself anything other than passably competent at video games, but for tens of fleeting moments, Ultra Kill gives me the feeling of being a true gamer. Yeah, I'm talking no shower, no respect, no concern for the job instability and crunch culture of the gaming industry, no fucks given. Dashing into a wall, jumping off of it, flipping two coins into the air and shooting them out of the sky makes me feel like when I touch the ground again, it'll be me sitting on the couch there at GDQ saying, yeah, so in the community, we call this one the Maximum Monkey Skin. Hell, I've never even really been into boomer shooters before, but my love of fast movement mixed with the primal brain urge to shoot thing in video game made me instantly fall in love with the cracked out hellscape that is Ultra Kill. There's also an insane amount of secrets that add quite a bit of replay value to what is already one of the most polished early access titles I've ever played, ranging from hidden orbs to secret boss fights, an entire Crash Bandicoot level, and a fucking exit existential dating sim? Whether it's wall jumping and blasting a giant boss with a railgun, dashing through the blood of my enemies to regain lost health, or overcharging a shotgun so hard it blows me up, this game's fucking awesome, and when I do it to the sweet sound of Ultra Kill's hyper-aggressive drum and bass metal soundtrack, I feel like Diddy Kong straight out of a Mario Strikers special attack. Dude, I am straight transcending when I play this game. I'll be real with you, maybe this will lose me my gamer license, but I've never really played much of the WarioWare titles. I actually don't even think I own any other than the newest entry. However, this did not at all affect my ability to enjoy the shit out of said newest entry, both while playing through the entire game alone and a copious amount of all character endless runs with a friend. It's got that classic Nintendo feel, bright and colorful characters, wacky music, silly micro games, and no online co-op. Every micro game is stupid as hell, the music is incredibly dynamic, with tempos, key changes, and instruments reacting to every moment of gameplay, and the replayability is given an all new coat of paint thanks to the character system. There are 18 characters, each with unique movement styles and abilities, and they can all clear every micro game. This means that every micro game has multiple solutions, some of which I didn't figure out until the 10th or 20th time around. Getting assigned random characters for each level is genius, forcing you to think on the fly even further and switching up difficulty anywhere from could do it with my eyes closed to the game gave me fucking 9 volt again. Dealing with two random characters in co-op ranges from being in perfect sync with your friend on the couch to staring down into their soul after an accidental sabotage. The biggest complaint I've heard about WarioWare is that it might not be worth the $50 price tag in terms of playtime, but I've never really been a fan of judging a game purely by its hour count. Regardless of how long I actually spent playing WarioWare, which was probably around 10 hours, I had fun. A lot of fun. You know those rare shining moments you can share with your friends where you start laughing so hard it hurts? Where you start wheezing and crying over the concept of squishing grapes into a jar? That's worth the price tag and more in my eyes. Although I do wish this multiplayer video game, released in the year 2021 by a major publisher, had online co-op so I could, I don't know, utilize my paid subscription. 
In a wacky twist of events, not unlike your stereotypical awards show, WarioWare will be taking home a second award today. That's right, though there are many fierce competitors like Write More Care Less from Rhythm Doctor, Disaster of Passion from Guilty Gear, Axe to Grind from Persona 5 Strikers, Echoes of the Eye from Outer Wilds, and Every Song in Near Replicant, my favorite individual song in a video game goes to Penny's theme. No question, no competition, don't even beef with me in the comments, bro, I don't even want to hear it. This song does things to my my soul, my heart, my my legs, cause I just be dancing. It's so bursting with life and positivity that I can't help but feel better when I listen to it. As a standalone song, it's adorable, reflecting the unbridled joy of playing WarioWare, but it's boosted to legendary status by the fact that it's synced up to Penny's micro games. If you pass each one, the song continues as normal, but if you fail, not only does the instrumentation slip up, but the singer's voice cracks and she sings different lyrics. the hell came up with this song, dude? It's so goddamn cheesy, but every time I hear... Some sort of water starts falling out of my eyes? What's with that? This song is so good that Nintendo themselves uploaded it officially to their YouTube channel in multiple languages. Have they... have they ever done this before? Are you guys feeling okay? Now, before I talk about the final game on my list, I wanted to quickly mention a lot of other great games that I played this year. They might not have gotten a full spotlight because they didn't release in 2021 or I already talked about them in a previous video, but they're still pretty awesome. Chicory, a heartwarming adventure with a jamming soundtrack where the entire map is a big placemat at a restaurant and oh baby, you just opened a brand new box of crayons. Rhythm Doctor, easily the most creative and unique rhythm game I've ever played and it has that cool ass level where the window flies all over your computer. Everhood. Just when you think this rhythm, action, dodging, bullet grabbing, fighting adventure game can't get crazier, you fight a 3D model of a trash can. I trusted you, 3D trash can model. Oh shit! Inscription. What starts out as a creepy deck building roguelike mixed with an escape room puzzle quickly evolves into much, much more. A short hike. Pretty much what the title says. My full title would be a very cute and short hike that makes you feel nice and comfy, but there's a reason I don't work in marketing. I finally played Breath of the Wild, and oh my god. And I finally got to Shadowbringers and Endwalker in Final Fantasy XIV, but we can't do that right now. If I was picking a game based solely on gameplay or the somehow quantifiable amount of fun I had playing it, my game of the year would probably be Shin Megami Tensei V. Well, other than Outer Wilds and the DLC, if Iron Pineapple hadn't also wanted to talk about it as his game of the year. But I already gave it an entire video's worth of spotlight. And while I technically played this final game on January 7th, 2022, time continues to be an illusion. So we'll just say I played it during my late December into early January holiday break. The final award, we'll call it the game that meant the most to me. I played Before Your Eyes for 107 minutes. Well, minus the four minutes that it took to set up the webcam and the two I spent going to the bathroom to get more tissues. In that time, it kicked my emotions around like a metaphorical hacky sack harder than I think any game has ever? Let me explain. Before Your Eyes is a game where the memories of the main character flash before your eyes, literally. You set up a webcam and it detects your blinks. You use these blinks to interact with the environment, but after a specific amount of time, a metronome enters the bottom of the frame, and once you blink, that memory is over and it's on to the next one. Now, I find that despite a certain unexplainable yearning to, I don't really cry at most media I watch, games I play, etc. You get it, I'm a tough guy, all right? I'm a gamer. <laughs> But when it came to Before Your Eyes, I felt like I was playing through a speedrun of the emotions I've felt in my arguably short 24 years of life so far, along with those that I still haven't, and it evoked something in me. From the beginning of the game, you're presented with this challenge, almost, to witness everything, and sometimes I'd get so caught up in not trying to blink that I wasn't paying full attention to the memory I was supposed to be witnessing. I see what you did there, game. Perhaps unintentionally. 
Clever. I'm obviously biased towards the interactive storytelling only capable through video games, but in the span of seconds, I'd be cracking a smile from a silly joke and then I'd blink and I'm super interested in the next event, but fuck, I left my eyes open too long on the last one and now I double blink and I miss the memory before anyone even starts talking, and bam, now I'm paused and running to the bathroom again because the game has punched me so hard in the metaphorical gut with either something I have felt before or a feeling I'm so afraid to experience or one that I just haven't experienced, but my god, the game is just that good at immersing you that you won't even notice I'm writing a horribly organized run-on sentence, which is what this game feels like, and I'll be right back, I gotta pause the game again, I literally have snot goop running out of my nose. In a lot of my videos I used to say, this game reminded me of why I started playing video games. The phrase childlike wonder became something of a running joke, and for Before Your Eyes, all I can really say is, it's a game about how nothing lasts forever, about remembering every precious moment in your life, no matter how seemingly insignificant, and it reminded me of why I love video games, I don't know. <laughs> why I do what I do, why I love to share new titles, and how I find the means to write pages upon pages of ramblings about all sorts of games, no matter how obscure, and pour hundreds of hours into creating these little videos. No matter how many times my dentist, or doctor, or anyone over the age of 40 just assumes I play Roblox for a living after I try to explain my job, I love talking about these experiences. But that's about it for my very special 2021 Game Awards. Subscribe if you enjoyed it, consider checking out my Patreon if you'd like to help support the channel, and I'd like to give an extra huge special thanks to everyone who participated. Make sure to check out their channels in the description, they all make fantastic videos. And uh, here's to 2022! I had a pretty calm end to last year, all things considered. No time-traveling alternate reality versions of me or anything. Oh, and I finally got my signed Supergiant vinyl! So I guess you could say last year went pretty well.